Hello and welcome back to the Grid Talk, Grid Talk podcast, everybody. This is episode number 238, where we're going to be previewing the 2022 United States Grand Prix. I'm your host, George Housen, and join me today, we have Grid Talk co-host, Tom Downey. Hello, sir. How are you? Very well, thank you. And Phil Matthew from the Grip Strip podcast. Hello, everybody. So before we get into the show, I'm going to give you a little reminder. If you enjoy this podcast, we would love it if you could take five to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you do, you'll be automatically going into our monthly draw to win a Grid Talk t-shirt like the one I'm sporting today and uh, or something else from our uh, champion range of merchandise. So... Uh, and as well, if you're one of the 72% of people who aren't yet subscribed to this channel on YouTube, please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe on that platform. So lads, we're heading to the United States Grand Prix. Max Verstappen is, of course, the champion for this year. Well, to, well done to him in that regard. I've not had a chance to say that yet, so I've not been on the show in a while. Um, but Tom, how do you see him getting on this weekend? Because obviously this is a track, I think, where he won last year. He's he's won the championship. That's sewn up. But another record that he's probably going to be going for is the the all time win record in a season. I think he's on twelve now, and the record is shared between Michael Schumacher and Sebastian Vettel on thirteen. And with the form that he's been in, it's looking likely he's going to break that record this season. Yeah. Um, ever since what Hungary, I'd say Max has just been he's just been on another level. Um, you know, I, I don't know if he's, I don't know if he like strokes the RB18 before he goes to bed or what, but it's just, it, he, it, we talk a lot in F1 about driver and machine being one. If you look at Hamilton during 2020 and, you know, some of his other uh, really, really, well, you know, so many of, of his good seasons and Vettel during his Red Bull days, um, especially that 2013 season where he won, what, nine races on the bounce at the end of the season. Max is at that, he's showing that kind of level now where, it doesn't matter where he starts on the grid. It doesn't matter what happens around him. He will just win. I mean, you know, you, you know, it, it was like, you know, Hungary start from, what was it? 10th, no problem. Um, uh, Spa start from 16th, no problem. Um, Monster start from 7th, no problem. He's just like, you know, he's just, it, it, you could start him like the next state over in like New Mexico or something and he'd probably still win. Um, I don't even know if New Mexico is directly next to Texas. I can't remember which. No, is it Arizona? I don't care. Um, uh, I'm sure Phil will will, will, uh, will update us, um, whichever one it is. Um, and anyway, um, yeah, it's just a, you know, I think Max can seriously break the record for race wins this season. We've got four races left, and he needs to win two of them. So he could win uh, next weekend. I mean, who else would you say will win there? I mean, even if you look at previous years, like 2021, he somewhat held on for the win when Hamilton was actually hunting him down. Um, but Max has already got the title sewn up. You know, he's he's just he, he's not he, he hasn't got that kind of pressure that he had last year. So there's a very good chance that he he's just going to rock up, put it on pole. Just scoot off from from you know from from pole. The only thing I say about coach is if you start P two, it seems to give you a bit of a benefit because if you have even the, I'd say an equal launch to pole because of how tight the radius is at turn one, you know it's, it's up the hill borderline hairpin. The outside, you know, so turn so if you're starting from second, that line up um, effectively becomes the inside line as you come out of out to turn one, and you have a slightly wider turning radius. So. Maybe Max just cuts off whoever's in P2, or if, if it's a Red Bull front row, you know, Perez will probably be told to, to stay put. You can win in Mexico. I'd love for that to happen, by the way. Um, and then um, and then yeah, and then that's that. I think he's gonna break the record. I don't think he'll win every single race this season or every single remaining race, mainly because I think Perez will win in Mexico. You know, he was on the podium last year or the rest of it. And I'd just love to see it for him. But yeah, I mean, what you know, but I what, what else can you say about Max at the minute? Yeah, Tom Downey's uh, US geography may be questionable, but Max Verstappen's pace this season has been. Uh, <laughs> I think he's. I think he's saying that uh, Max Verstappen's going to get a P two this weekend. But um, go on, go on, Phil. Sorry, <laughs> geography isn't completely off. He was right that it's the next state over, but relative to the location of Austin, Louisiana is closer to 
Austin, Texas, where the track is located, then getting to New Mexico, where the great Umzer family is from. There's my American thing coming through there. There we go. A little GCSE uh, geography for, for you guys for free, as an, in addition to great analysis on a uh, Grid Talk podcast, as always. Um, but yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you, Tom. I mean, just the pace of Verstappen. It's almost like it doesn't matter where he starts, he's going to win. There's a whacking great long back straight in Kota. It's one of the easier tracks to over- overtake around, and it's obviously one that he's won out before. Um, but we mentioned Sergio Perez there, Phil. Obviously, his big race is going to be in Mexico a couple of weeks after, obviously. But uh, there's going to be a lot of Mexicans coming over the border for the, the race at, around Cota as well. He's going to have a lot of support there. He's going to be egged on. And it's uh, for a while as well, it wasn't, you know, his, you know, his performances weren't that great because I think uh, I think he had a different floor or something like that. But he was back on form in Japan. He, you know, he pressured Charles Leclerc into making that mistake and getting P2 after the penalty. So how do you think Checo is going to get on this weekend? It's just going to go from strength to strength for Checo now. Uh, now that... Uh the driver's championship is done their next focus is of course the first constructor since 2013 um it's more or less a, a foregone conclusion in that sense as well but um the third piece is Sergio Perez trying to beat Charles Leclerc for second in the world driver's championship um so they can get a clean sweep of sorts uh, i wouldn't be surprised if Sergio Perez qualifies on pole uh, this weekend at at uh, Coda. I mean, Max is more likely to get the better start. They'll let him lay over. He goes and wins fine. But um, I do think that Sergio Perez is going to run these next four races as hard as he's run any four races in his career because this is this is as be- the best he's ever going to do um, in his driving career, probably to finish second in the world championship being a loyal domestique, doing what he had to do, basically taking a bogey floor and struggling, um, you know, for whatever that may mean later on um, with some of the other stuff that's going on in Red Bull. But um, I do think that he's going to have plenty of pace. Uh, I do agree with Tom that Mexico, I think they're going to put everything in the basket of Sergio to make sure that he could have the weekend of his life and and set that whole entire track you know like they they might have to redo the whole entire track because i think all the grandstands are going to fall off if sergio perez won the mexican grand prix but um i i do think that this is going to be a good build up there i i don't know maybe there i ha- i'm not sure about engine penalties or any type of um power unit penalties that they may have had so far this year off the top of my head but there might be a sacrifice as well on this weekend with that in mind, um, knowing they're going into altitude for Mexico. There's a little bit of altitude also with Brazil, um, you know, so that, that they can go and run well and possibly get him those wins that he needs to lock up second world championship. But I mean, they're the best team this year by far. And um, they have the best driver this year. And, uh, and more than likely they're going to have the second best driver this year as well. Uh, I don't think that's going to change at Coda. It's a track that is uniquely built for a car of that, of that level, which the Red Bull this year has been at. Yeah, it is the best all round car this year, the Red Bull, especially now. I mean, it might not have started that way, but it's definitely ended up that way as the championship's gone on. And Cota's is a very all round track. It tests up, tests all aspects of the car straight line, speed, aerodynamics, the chassis, everything. And if you've got a great car, you're going to do well around there, as we've seen so many times with Mercedes at the pa- in the past as well. Um, uh, but let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about Ferrari next. Um, uh, Charles Leclerc. Again, getting a podium in Japan. Obviously, Carlos Sainz, he could have done something, but he aquaplaned off the circuit. Could have happened to anybody. I'm sure some people may say driver error. I, I don't think it was. I don't think anybody could have avoided that. He just got a bit unlucky with the river. Um, but Charles Leclerc showing, so, showing some good fight, showing some good pace, but it's it's difficult to see him winning this weekend, Tom. It just looks as though whichever Red Bull's out front, the, the Ferrari's just not. Are going to be quick enough, even if they perfect the strategy, obviously, which is still obviously a very um, big question mark on them. But even if everything does go right, I just don't think they have the ultimate pace to win, really. 
You just say before I perfect the strategy. Come on, mate. They're the, going to they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna shit the bed on the strategy. They let's not do. let's not describe it that way, Tom. Please. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, my apologies. Yes. No. The, yeah. Um, yeah. If, if, yeah. I mean, Ferrari strategy will just be hashtag just Ferrari things. But um, you know, r- regardless of any of that, you know, e- even if Red Bull started with their car facing the wrong way around, they'd probably be quicker quicker than the, um, than the Ferrari. After such a promising start to the season, you know, if if, if you look, I'm looking at the class stats up here. I just like to point out it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Shad! You're 25 today, on the day of recording. Um, side notes, yeah, you know, he, he won Bahrain. Uh, he came second to Saudi, and then he won in in um, Australia. Uh, then after that, he won in Austria. The last time he won the season was in Austria. And he hasn't even looked. I mean, he looked like he might have won in uh, Paul Ricard, but then he put it in the wall. And I think from there on in, it's just been a combination of strategy imploding and Ferrari imploding and everything. They just don't have the pace. I said it before, and I say it again. They're a team that don't know how to win, and they do, they just don't know what they're doing at the minute. If you look at them from when they were there with like the sort of Schumacher era, you know, they had Ross Braun and. Um, John Todd and whoever else on the pit walls and and Bonotto was obviously on the technical side of it. They're lacking that kind of leadership. And I think they made a mistake when they got rid of Ariva Bene at the end of 2017, I believe it was. They should they should have kept they should have kept him and then trusted Bonotto to keep the tech side of things. The problem with Ferrari is they've got they've not just got the expectation of you know of, of everybody because one of the oldest names in F1, like McLaren. Ferrari is a nation. They represent Italy in Formula One. Ferrari is Italy, and Italy is Ferrari, especially in Formula One. You know, you, you know, if you look at the success they've had in the past, so there is so much more enhanced scrutiny on them. You know, if anything they do, they're going to be under the microscope, and you know, people are going to be asking questions about um, about why they did this, or why they didn't do that, or you know, their name is going to be dragged through the mud. It's like when. Um, when signs won in um, Silverstone, people were uh, you know, just going hounding Ferrari for making like strategic errors and all the rest of it. But ironic. Um, so it's uh, you know, so it, it's even without the sort of performance differential of their car, which has I suspect they've probably start developing it this year because they're not going to they're not going to win either championship. They'll be lucky if they hold on to a second with the rate Mercedes are catching up at the moment. So that that is their battle. They just need to beat Mercedes. Leclerc needs to qualify ahead of both Ferrari, uh, sorry, both Mercedes drivers, um, which I don't think will be too much of an issue. But it's a bit sad to see that their battle, given how promising the season started out at, has um, has fizzled into nothingness. It, it is. It's, it's been a spectacular fall for him, to be honest with you. And it was looking quite likely for a while that um, Mercedes would overtake them for second place. There's a bit of a gap there now, to be fair. Um, nearly 70 points between the two teams. Not insurmountable, but I think Ferrari will probably hold on, to be honest. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll we'll talk about Mercedes next, Phil, because uh, I, I mean, I was looking over the previous winners. I mean, there was a time not that long ago where Sir Lewis Hamilton was just absolutely untouchable around this circuit, but he hasn't won here since 2017. And there are there are some points on the track, especially around the S's section, where you'd expect the bottoming out of the car to, uh, you know, with the porpoise and everything, to potentially affect Mercedes a bit more than other teams. But overall, it's it's a track that in the historically has suited them. So how do you see Hamilton and Russell getting on this weekend? In regards to them trying to get back into this uh, constructors championship. Uh... I think they're going to be all right in that sense uh, because the car has shown wild ride ability and drivability and everything else seems to be pretty bad um, to be relatively reliable, uh, you know, knock on wood, they'll, this will be the weekend they blow up both engines, but um, for people that hate them, but you know, like the, I, who knows? I, I mean, it, this car is very finicky. There's been circuits, the much slower circuits, high downforce has been their, their, um, the tracks where they've been the best. Then there's been the longer, faster circuits where they've been in no man's land. Um, Coda is one of Lewis Hamilton's best racetracks, period. It's he won there the first time there. He's been great in the United States and in North America 
in general in his career, both in U.S. and in Canada. Um, I know he wants to run well here. He's posting, he lives out in San Fran, it seems like, because he seems to be posting videos all the time on his socials. Um, but, you know, the... I think George needs a recovery run this weekend. He's been a little bit off the last couple of weeks. Um, Lewis has been a little, hasn't been there either. Um, the rain probably has not been great for that car, but then what really is good for that car at this point? I think a dry weekend uh, will, we can kind of see where the upgrades are at. They're bringing their last upgrade of the season uh, this weekend. So who knows? Um, it is a rough racetrack. It's one of the rougher racetracks they're going to end up running on all year, uh, because of the elements and it's an older track. It's been 10 years or 11 years since they made it or whatever it is. Um, they've resurfaced a lot of it over time because of NASCAR coming over there now. Um, I think they should be where they've been, you know, right on the back end of the top five, and um, maybe they can flirt for a podium, but uh, I'm not really sure. It's a, it, I, I really don't know. These long, I think Brazil and Abu Dhabi are more suited to what this car is capable of relative to um, these two next two tracks, mainly because of these super long straightaways. Um, the straightaway length at the other two tracks is a little bit more reasonable, I think, where they can mitigate that um, disadvantage. Yeah, they're a tough one to uh, predict, Mercedes. They've been they've been quite good for most of the season, but I'm just looking at the the results now. Two podiums in the last five races between the two drivers, which is far cry from what it was uh, not long ago. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see how they get on. Obviously, Hamilton having a lot of success around this track in the past, but it's been a while for them at, at Cota. Um, another team that's going to be hoping to do well, um, carry the form across, um, is uh, is to, is Alpine next. They're back up to fourth in the Constructors' Championship after McLaren surprisingly took that back in Singapore. But better results in um, in Japan, obviously, uh, elevated and back up to fourth. It's quite a tight battle between those two teams. But I'd, I'd say, I'd say, Tom, to be honest with you, that they probably have the advantage over McLaren overall. The, the car does seem better and obviously two drivers that are in a lot of form, a good form as well. I mean, Ocon, for me, one of the star performers in Japan to get fourth place. Yeah. Um, Al Alpine are sort of weird enigma in F1 at the minute. They're, they're, they're a bit like a Harlequin that sort of just sits there. It's just like one minute I'm going to be this, the next minute I'm going to be that. It's like one minute they'll be going out in Q1 in Singapore and leaking points to McLaren, like you said. And the next thing, uh, Ocon, the same guy who went out in Q1 in Singapore, is finishing P4 after a storm in quality, uh, and then finishing P4 holding off Hamilton in Suzuka in the wet. It's just like, you know, it's just, it almost sort of doesn't matter what I say I think they'll do, because whatever, whatever we think, they'll do the opposite. And I swear they've got like CIA mind control stuff where whatever someone thinks is going to happen, they'll just calculate and do the opposite. So I could sit here and think, they're going to finish P20 and they'll go and score a bloody one too. You know, it's, uh, it, it's just, uh, Alpine's such, such a strange one. And the team, the team sort of like as uh, general, I don't know if it's the Otmar Safnar influence or what, but there just seems to be a weird dynamic in that team at the minute. It's like, did, did, did you see, did you see the photo they put up of Gasly and, um, and Ocon? Um, after it's announced that Gas is joined. It was a kind of picture where, where your mum says, right, go and stand next to that cousin who you don't know and smile for the camera so I can send it to your nan. You know, it was it was it, it was just really, really awkward. That's the easiest way I can describe it. And it, you know, it, it, it's sort of it's sort of like that pain smile. It's just like every, and 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 Otmar just look, looks like that weird uncle that you know that you shouldn't sort of leave alone or something. It's just uh it's just yeah, it's just they've it's just it's hard to describe the, the the whole dynamic, and I think with Alonso going and everything, it's last year they everything sort of seemed to click and gel, and they were there was almost like a bit of a bromance between um, Alonso and Ocon. Whereas this year, um, you know, Alonso's got one foot out the door; he'll probably be back in three seasons. He always is with Enstone. Um, you know, he, you know, he, he he'll he'll probably have his flipping funeral there no it have um you know so you know but um yeah but it's just uh 
Yeah, it's just it's just weird, Alpine. I, I don't really know how to describe it, which is impressive given I just waffled for a lot about it. Um, but um, but yeah, Kuta's obviously a track, like you said, and you said very well, that tests all elements of a car. You know, it's you need a balanced setup. It's like do you go for a higher downforce for that sort of last section, which is sort of like imitation turkey turn eight, but going the other way, or do you or do you run lower downforce for the for the two long straights? Um, the, you know, the, the sort of like sector one, sort of then half a sector two bit. It, it, you know, it's 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 it. Yeah, it it, it poses a lot of questions and 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 need, you know, needs needs a lot of thought. So, I th- I think Alpine will do well, and and I think um, given how we saw the car go at Suzuka, where it went pretty well down the straights and was holding up the Mercedes and all the rest of it, I think they'll they'll be ahead of McLaren, no issue. I think they'll be knocking on the door of Mercedes. Well, I mean, given the pace in the, in the wet in Japan, you know, obviously very different circumstances. It's definitely possible, you know. Ocon, I think mainly because of the straight line speed of that car, but he legitimately kept Hamilton behind, despite Hamilton probably being faster at that point. Um, so, you know, fair play to him in that regard. It, it, it is a very weird dynamic with Alpine, you're right. You know, you've got, you've got Alonso who is leaving, you know, he's still going to do his best, of course. We don't doubt that. I mean, the, the guy was absolutely hounding Sebastian Vettel in Japan. There's no question about his commitment in the car. Um, but out of the car, it's it's very odd for sure. I mean, obviously, I, I, I cannot believe that Gasly is going to that team. I've said on a number of occasions I didn't see it happening in a billion years. They do not like each other. It's clear they don't. And I haven't seen that picture you're talking about, Tom. But um, obviously, yeah, if it, if it is that kind of dynamic, if it does seem a bit forced just to be like, oh, yeah, they get on, don't worry. We prove it by taking a picture of them together. You know, it's um, it's not really confidence-inspiring. And, yeah, I'm sure they will, you know, they'll work to do the best they can together at the team. But as soon as, as, soon as one thing happens, as soon as they crash or there's some sort of disagreement about pitch strategy or anything like that, all hell's going to break loose. And let's not forget that Nico Rosberg and Lewis Hamilton were best friends before they were teammates at Mercedes. They end up that way by the time the Rosberg left the team, did it? So anyway, I digress. Uh, let, let's get on to my team. Let's get on to McLaren next, Phil. Um, I think it's about 13 points or so off the top of my head between uh, between the two teams. It is between them and uh, Alpine. Obviously, they're locked in that battle. They've been in that battle all season long. It's it's a difficult one to kind of predict. Again, with McLaren, they seem to be very good one weekend and very bad the next. That's what we saw in Singapore and Japan. They were just off the pace in Japan. Both cars as well, not just uh, not just Ricardo. Even Lando Norris was struggling. Um, so how do you predict they're going to get on this weekend? Because, like I said, this is a track that tests all elements of the car, and it could be one that McLaren potentially get found out at. Yeah, there's, <clears throat> with the power unit deficit that they have relative to Alpine and then the car being uh, inconsistent there, I would say that that is a, a a concern and they lost whatever gap they get a double top five at Singapore and then go and um, basically give it all away in Japan. Um, these next two races might be difficult, but then Lando had a bad race. So he usually is one to kind of bounce back. Um, Daniel Ricardo loves Coda. He knows that he's going on a sabbatical for a year, taking a year off. Doesn't sound like he wants to do any other type of racing. He has some pie in the sky notion that he's going to get back into Formula One and get in a better car than he was in the last four years. Um, he's one of my favorite people, but it's not going to happen. Um, the notion is for them, they need to cut that gap. They, th- their goal now is to just chip away at it, kind of have Alpine and they've had Alpine in their sights all year. They should be trying to chip away a couple points or race so that Abu Dhabi, they have a chance. Um, I figure, you know, it, it, Ricardo seems to be a little more in tune now. Um, and I think that was the question then the big problem they've had earlier this year. Um, now that I believe both drivers are kind of in, I think they have a better chance to get back in the constructors and get that fourth in constructors. Um, both cars in the points, I don't think is out of the realm. There might be struggles in qualifying, but I think their race pace generally um, is better than their qualifying pace overall. So um, I do feel like they'll be able to compete. 
Um, but it, it it's the same thing with Alpine. You never know. So we could be completely, we could be talking about it one way and then it could go the other way and we'll see some other people that never are really up there, up there this weekend. Yeah. Anything can happen in Formula One and it usually does as we know. So, um, and a team that, whose drivers are very unlikely to score any points, like we just mentioned there, is, uh, is Alfa Romeo. Um, still sixth place in the Constructors' Championship, but just seven points between them and Aston Martin now. That has changed around so much. And I'm just looking at the results here. And how many races is that? That's one, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They've scored one point in the last nine races, Alfa Romeo. They're in dismal form. The car's not particularly quick, but on top of that, it's proved to be extremely unreliable, especially in the hands of Grand Joe, not blaming him by any means, but the guy's had so much bad luck with reliability. Um, Tom, can you shine some sort of light on this situation? I mean, Bottas has won here in the past, which is something, I suppose, but it's it's very difficult to see them getting a top 10, really. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be getting a top 10, to be honest, mate. They are, um, they're very hamstrung by that Ferrari power unit, which... It's not something I thought I'd say at the start of the season, but that's where they are. Ever since that Ferrari upgrade came in sort of well, around May time, which is when any Ferrari power car started either blowing up or not turning on, um, Alfa Romeo had just fallen off a cliff, much like Haas. You know, after such a promising start to the season for, for both of them, it's no coincidence that as the Ferrari form dips with the... Um, uh, with uh, you know, with uh, with the sorry, it's no coincidence that the, the the Ferrari support of the Ferrari junior teams, whatever you call them, dipped as the Ferrari power unit started to have its issues, and then on the flip side, the Mercedes have had the rise. So, I think Alfa Romeo, the, 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 it's in, it, it is again a, a bit of an odd one because you've got Bottas there who is solid but unspectacular, you know, so just gets the job done, comes with a lot of experience, um, but was never really in that top echelon of drivers. Nice guy, don't get me wrong. You know, seems, seems like a cool guy you'd want to go for a beer with, just not going to his ice link like Ted Kravitz did. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and you know, Joe Guan Yu has done very well given the significant reliability issues he's had, because you know, he's missed out, I'd say, three or four point scoring opportunities where the car has let him down. Um, I don't know if I'll get points the rest of the season. If I'm being honest, you know, maybe Abu Dhabi. But if you look at the circuits we've got left, you know, it's uh, it's not looking promising for them. Um, I mean, you know, Mexico is it's not going to do them any favours, I don't think. Uh, this, this circuit, I think, because of what I said earlier about, about the circuit needing a sort of, sort of balanced setup. I think they're going to sort of have a jack of all trades hat up where they'll be too draggy on the straights, uh, which will mean that they'll have a sort of all right middle come end sector, but they just won't be able to make up the time through that middle sector that they'll lose on the straights. I think they'll just get past left, right, and center. Quality might be a bit of a false positive because obviously you can open the rear, you can open the rear wing, get that DRS, get that, get that airflow in. Um, so quality might look okay. You know, they might go into Q2 or something. I'm not saying Q3, not by a long shot. Um, you know, they might go into Q2, but if that does happen, I think they'll, they'll get solid up. Um, especially if you look at Aston Martin, you tend to have pretty poor quality pace, but decent race pace. That's what I think might happen, and I don't think it's looking good for them this weekend. No, it, it's not looking promising for them, no. It's... Um... Yeah, the only the only really kind of reprise recently has been uh, that, that single point in, uh, in the Italian Grand Prix and we had a few retirements that allowed that, to be fair, even then. So, no, it's not looking good for them. And they are under serious threat, like I mentioned, of uh, being overtaken by Aston Martin, Phil. They've, Aston Martin recently, I mean, I've, I've said for a while now, they've been very consistent in scoring points. Not a lot of points, but they've always been scoring pretty much the whole time. But recently in Singapore and Japan, they've had some big holes of points and it's been deserved. They've been really good. They've... They've aced the strategy. They've been difficult to pass, and they've just converted it again. So it's you know it's look it's looking lightly, especially in the hands of Sebastian Vettel. But they could be in for another good weekend this weekend. Yeah, who would have thought that that team that for many years has made mistakes in strategy and has screwed up some really great results would be the team that actually is able to make strategy and come from the depths of despair, um, ninth in constructors. 
and now they're definitely more than likely going to get past all the the two Ferrari G um, uh, customer teams. Uh, of course, Williams, which we'll talk about later, that doesn't really matter as much. But um, I mean, the thing with uh, Vettel, I mean, he's he's on his run uh, to the end of his uh, illustrious career. He's won there before eight top tens in nine starts at Coda. So, I mean, I don't think qualifying, their qualifying has definitely not been Aston Martin's thing this year. Um, but it doesn't mean that if they're very good on their tires and long runs in FP2, who knows? I, I think it's a track where strategy is going to play a role. Um, if you're able to get yourself out in clean air, gets uh, with an undercut, that might be the way to go. Uh, I don't think running long at Coda really plays out all that well, because if you're getting held up and you're trying to get through the first and third sectors are, are very difficult in terms of tire wear and front end grip. So I think Vettel wants to run well here. He loves the U S and um, he can go and kind of speak out on some of his, uh, the, some of the things that he's very passionate about here and, Mexico, Brazil, running this out. And um, he's going to be very motivated to um, get some more points. And they've been uh, they've been doing a good job. I mean, it's kind of too little too late, I guess. But, you know, every dollar counts, um, even though they've done a minor breach too. But that's more documentation. Um, but then when you consider it's Orange Stroll, I'm not surprised that his documentation doesn't really fit. Um, I still don't know where the guy made that much money. Uh, but... That's beside the point. We'll see what happens with Aston Martin. I think they'll um, be back into the points on Sunday. Um, and with the reliability, they should be in a, in the mix uh, here these next couple of races. Um, Brazil is a great track for Vettel, too. So something that to look forward to in his um, retirement tour. Yeah, you know, uh, Aston Martin, I mean, if you had told us a few months ago that they'd be up in seventh with a chance of sixth in the constructors championship i wouldn't have believed you because they were they seemed, they seemed uh pretty dismal down in ninth but you know they've made real progress recently and it's absolutely it's gonna you know it could win them tens of millions of dollars when it comes to the end of the season you know in prize money so it's huge for them at the end of the day and they've got a very good chance to get in that sixth place in my opinion and i think they will do all right around cota i think they'll do all right this weekend um another team that i'll be really hoping to do uh well very well this weekend is the is Haas. obviously it's their home race um, but I've just looked up the results again. Seven races it's been since they've scored. They haven't scored since Austria, like well before the summer break. Tom, I mean, uh, they're another team like Alfa Romeo, possibly because of the Ferrari power unit. They just seem to have fallen off a cliff, really. They had a mini revival in the middle of the season, but that seems like a very, very long time ago now. Um, obviously, K Mag is going to do his best in that car. Mick Schumacher's racing for his career, some people may argue. So, how do you see them getting on this weekend? Not great, if I'm honest. Um, I mean, you know, they've 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 got to a point now where they're just uh, they're just sort of like holding, sort of like holding on until the end of the season. Um, a season that I've said this before, and I'll say it again: a season that promised so much, and uh, yeah, I've well, I have never seen a season that has uh, that has promised so much and delivered so little. For a team that's apparently on 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 the sort of rebuild, they just you know I think they've been a bit hampered by their by the Ferrari pay unit issues, like like we said, but they've also been hampered by both drivers having incidents. Um, and if K if if Mick can keep it at the wall and Kevin cannot have a black and yellow flag, because people right people right here we go, people rip on Mick a lot, and yeah, he has had a lot of accidents. And I think some of them went a bit unnoticed last year because of his questionable teammates who shall not be named. This year, we've seen those accidents again, you know, that horrendous impact at Jeddah and Monaco as well, where the car split into, gave me serious 2020 flashbacks to Grosjean when his car you know, split into two at Bahrain or Sakir, whichever, whichever race it was at the end of the season. <sighs> k not been entirely sort of 
not innocent, but you know, but he's not exactly kept his nose clean. You know, he's 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 the only driver to have, to have had two black and yellow flags for front wings. Granted, one of them was by Ocon whining like a little so and so on the radio in Canada. He's saying, "Here we go, me." Um, you know, that's a that's an accurate representation, by the way. Um, but you know, but but there, there was another one I think in Singapore where his front wing, his front end plate was hanging off a bit. And someone came on the radio, I can't remember who it was, and said, you know, oh, that's dangerous, needs a black and yellow flag. Um, and it's like, does it really? But, you know, if, the, if K-Mag wouldn't have got into those sort of incidents in the first place, then he could have been in a position to score points. You know, Mick's not the only one who hasn't scored points this season. You know, he's Mick has out-qualified K-Mag a few times, and he's doing all right. Um, so, you know... You can't point the finger just at Mick Schumacher. You've got to look a bit at K-Mag as well. I'm not saying that Mick is sort of like safe by any stretch. Far from it. I think his days are numbered at Haas, and especially with the rumours swirling around Hulkenberg and Giovinazzi of all people. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, the only thing I say about Giovinazzi is Lucy clashes at the same place every year. You know, uh, you know, specifically Spa, um, same corner as well. It was. Um, it's yeah. It's just. I just again, I just don't, I don't see much coming from them this season. You know, the, the, I, I wonder if they've given up on this season. I think they're just hanging on to seventh where they are. I think Aston Martin will overtake them in the championship standings, which I did not think I'd say at the start of the season. But alas, here we are. That's what I think will happen. I don't think they'll get points um, this time out. It's a far cry from the last time we were in the north of America where they qualified P five, P six. Um, in uh, in uh, in Canada, was it P five P six or was it P seven P eight? They locked out either the third or fourth row. I, I think, think it was it, the third row. Yeah, I think it was the third row. That ain't gonna happen this time. They'll be they'll be lucky if they lock out the back row with with, with the way they're going. Um, so so yeah, it's it's not looking good for them. I don't think. No, it's not. I mean, you mentioned that um, Aston, you wouldn't be surprised if Aston Martin overtake Aston in the standings. They have done they've, by eleven points as well. Aston are well clear. Oh, there you go then. You know, and, and the thing is as well for Haas is it gets even worse because they are allowed level on points with Alfred Tauri. They're both on 34 points. It is extremely close between those two. One point swings it either way. One, potent, you know, potentially like an 11th, 12th place result could swing it either way. I don't know all the mathematics of it, but not not a lot. It's not going to take a lot to swing that one, Phil. Um, and yeah, I mean, Alfred Tauri, though, they haven't been particularly great, but they have been picking up the odd point of late. It's not been that rare for them um gasly obviously he's confirmed as an alpine driver now i i don't think that's going to change his mindset too much really to be honest with you and sonoda obviously i think if anything that might egg him on it might be like look now is the time to show that you know i'm ready to take this team by hold next season when nick devries comes so how do you think alpha tari going to get on at kota yeah you know they're, they're racing against Haas, so they really don't have to do much of anything now whether that means they're going to score points or not it's to be determined i think gasly wants to finish out on a high note but the car isn't really going to help him with that uh yuki will do yuki things he'll be takuma sato 2.0 so there will be a very flashy cool moment um then followed up by either an epic um explosion or a crash um but i mean i i really it's it's kind of sad the way haas is running but then it doesn't really shock me considering who gene haas is and the way he seems to run his motorsports entities um while his um co-owner or main owner in the nascar series is getting fed up with it and going with his wife to the nhra races so i guess he'll be over there next week maybe Maybe Tony will be at at uh, Coda next week instead of uh, um, going to the NASCAR race at uh, Homestead. But uh, aside the point with with I, I really don't know because they, they this team this car there's been years I mean it makes no sense to me what has happened to Pierre Gasly personally. Um, I think it's all car. Um, I don't and I also don't think he really is invested in this Red Bull you know, nonsense. So he's like, all right, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, they have a chance. I think if Red Bull was smart, they would go and try to put a little bit more energy into them, try to, you know, 
get whatever within within the limits of the the budget cap uh, to go and get them over the edge against um, I guess uh, Haas. Um, they're already there, but really um, they should be much better than that. I, I think I when you have a power unit that is winning every basically every race. Um, you would think they could make a decent car, but obviously they didn't make a decent car. They didn't make a clone of the Red Bull, um, like other teams seem to make clones like Aston Martin and others, but I don't really have high hopes for them, but maybe they'll surprise us on uh, Sunday. Yeah, I think that um, I think Alpha Tari have potentially been one of the teams that have suffered the most when it comes to how close the field is this season, how much closer it is than, than last season, because 34 points last season, That'd probably be enough for like seventh, sixth, perhaps. You know, that's 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 a good haul. But because the field has been so close, that's only good enough for ninth as it stands, um, or eighth in the case of uh, the pass. Obviously, they're on the same amount of points, but still, that, that's a that's a far cry from what it has been. Which is great for us as fans because it means teams more scoring more regularly, especially further down the field. But Alpha Tower have really suffered with that, so um, we'll have to see how they get on. They've not been particularly great, but they have scored points semi regularly recently. So there is that. Um, now, last up, we've got Williams, obviously, that we know where they're going to be coming into the, the season. The, the car's not good enough to get any any higher than, than 10th. Again, they have been one of those ones as well that have suffered with how close the field is. Eight points last season, probably get you eighth, but uh, not this season. They're, they're stone dead last. But surprisingly, Tom, obviously, Latifi somehow scored points in Japan. I'm not fully over that yet. The guy, somehow this season, he seems to get the best out of that Williams car in the wet weather and no other time other than that. Um, but obviously this this weekend, it's typically, typically Texan weather. It's 30 degrees and sunny, so there's no chance of any rain uh, giving him some sort of reprise there. But obviously, we, I mean, try, try and try and big up Williams a little bit, mate. I mean, it's, I know it's not easy, but um, obviously Alex Albon could do something if he's fully recovered. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm I mean, not giving you an easy one there. I'm sorry. No, uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean um, Albon might get out of Q1 at a push. I oh, I kind oh, of feel I, like oh, Albon is going to do yeah. all right this weekend. Yeah, I, I think you'll do And I'll tell you, here's one for you: the Tifi will qualify P20, but he will finish P19 because we'll have a DNF. Is that the bold prediction? Get him in early. Well, <laughs> I mean, I have nothing to say about Williams. Just, I, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll save this part of the segment. I honestly think that Albon, he's done all right there, um, in limited starts. Of course, um, his one, well, one, um, he finished in the top five, but that was, of course, in a red max. But um, in this Williams car with that second sector there have been moments where he's been able to get the most out of that car. I think these next three races, especially Mexico um, will kind of suit that Williams with the low drag setup, even Abu Dhabi kind of sort of with the way they adjusted it. But I mean, yeah, it's going to be difficult. They don't have a great team. We don't know who their second driver is going to be. I think we're waiting on Abu Dhabi and the results of that race to kind of figure out what will happen with that. Uh, Phil, it's... Oh, never mind, sorry. I shouldn't have interrupted you there. <laughs> I was going to say, oh, it's this guy, but it's not. They haven't decided it yet, my bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they, they... I'm pretty sure who it's going to be, but he has to finish in a certain place since Mario Andretti was making fun of making sure he needs to get his super license points yesterday when he was testing a McLaren at Laguna Seca. Um, but, you know, it's... You're, they're just running out the string here. Um, Albon is who they're building with as their lead driver, and that's a good thing. Uh, I think energies are going towards next year. You know, make the most out of it. Hopefully I get my name on their car. I, I might be able to see it. It goes slow enough, so I might be able to see it in the W. Um, but I'll, I'll see if that happens. I'll see if I won that that uh, prize thing to be one of the eight seven hundred ninety nine names on the W on the FW44. 
that that'd be cool to see your name on there. Definitely. Good luck with that, Phil. Hope, uh, hope we get some grip, grip talk and some grip strip uh, representation on the uh, on the Williams car. That'd be a cool one. It's at that'd least be... worth a ten. It has to be worth at least a couple hundreds. Grip strip and grid talk should be at least two hundreds. Still will mean the back, but hey, it's a couple hundreds. At, at least we're on the grid. So that's that's the main thing. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I don't know why, but I just had an absolute brain fart there, Phil. Sorry for interrupting you. I was going to be like, no, it's Nick, it's Nick DeVries. I'm like, no, that's Alphatari, idiot. Wrong one. <laughs> I still can't believe he's gone to Alphatari. That's, I mean, I'm glad he's on the grid, don't get me wrong, but that's a that's a surprising one. But there we go. Um, so, yeah, Williams, you know, but I do agree with you about Williams with, um, with Mexico. I think they will do quite well there. The low drag will definitely suit that whacking great long straight they have down there for the pitch straight and the one after that. Now, the second straight is long enough by itself. Um, but yeah, Kota could be a, a very painful one for them, unfortunately. Um, Alex Albon will do his best, I'm sure, but he can only get so much out of that car at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, let's uh, the, let's let's move on. Those are the 20 drivers, the 10 teams. We've gone through them all. Um, let's say our predictions now. Let's go with our top three predictions, and I'll get on to our bold, bold predictions as well after that. Um, you know what? I'm just for a very excitement. I'm going to say that I'm going to give Sergio Perez the win and I'm going to say Max Verstappen in second and third place. Let's let's go with Carlos Sainz. Let's go a little different. Let's go for him for a bit of a bounce back result. Um, Tom, what's your podium predictions for this weekend? I'm going to flip on his head. I'm going to say uh, Leclerc P1, Sainz P2 and uh, sorry, Perez P2, Sainz P3. Okay. All right. All right, Phil. Uh, ver per uh lack. Uh, that'll, that'll that's that's the uh, so uh, Max Verstappen adds and to his deal there. Perez consolidates a second, and Leclerc. Uh, no, no stroke. Um, the back in the old days when we were going by the three-letter combinations. So. Um, and us Americans, we have to go and make uh, whatever the we have to go and shorten everything. So, first stop in Perez Leclerc this week, um, and then we'll see about Mexico. I figure we could just swap the top two on that one at Mexico. The scenes if Sergio Perez will uh will get a win in Mexico would be unreal. I mean, the scenes when he got a podium last season were pretty ridiculous. Like, you'd swear the guy was won, won the race, but... Uh, I think yeah. that would be the end of Hermanos Rodriguez circuit if he does win <laughs> the, the Mexico Grand Prix. No, I don't want it to end. I, I wish they hadn't messed up that last section and they still had the Peraltada, but the notion is I want to see that personally. It would be great. Yeah, they said it couldn't be done because of the banking, but then obviously a few years later we went to Zandvoort where there's even more banking. So I don't get that one personally either. C- clearly it is safe. It can work with modern Formula 1 cars, so it's a shame. I do like how the fans are there in the baseball stadium. That's cool for after the race, but yeah, purely from a from a racing perspective, it does absolutely new to that final sector. It's horrible to drive in the game as well. So I can imagine the, uh, the guys out on the track think the same thing as well. Um, but yeah, so... Let's go with our bold predictions now. And, you know, I'm just, I'm again, I'm going to go against everything I've said for quite a long time. And I think I went for this in the last one that I previewed, which was Italy. And it was looking possible that he could have got a good finish had his car not, uh, had his car not retired. But I'm going to go, because he likes America, because he normally does well there, I'm going to go for Daniel Ricciardo for a top five, even though, if I'm being totally honest, I don't see it happening. I want to see it happen partly because I want to see McLaren do well. But um, yeah, beyond that, I don't think it's rooted in much reality that. Um, Tom, what's your bold prediction? First of all, I'd just like to say, I think that's pretty doable for Danny Rick. He's always gone well here. He went well here last year. Um, Mm. My bold prediction, Max DNF. It'd be typical, wouldn't it? It would. I think he'll overcook it into turn one. Ooh. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's got he's gone off in a lose at this point. He could make, he could finally make a mistake. You know, he could prove that Lewis, he is human. But Lewis is next to him. That's usually what he targets. So what would happen? <laughs> but um, my bold prediction 
Um, that's pretty bold um, because Max, I figure, wouldn't do that. Uh, not anymore. Um, my bold prediction is Alex Albon uh, gets points. Uh, I don't know why I, I just have this weird suspicion that Williams with Doritos and everybody, all the American connections and all that stuff. Um, I feel like Albon now he'll be a little healthier after a few more weeks and um, he wants to be engaged these next couple of weeks after DeVries did what he did um, kind of retake hold. I mean, he, we know he's the lead driver at that team, but um, I know that he knows that he can get more out of that car and um, this will be a good start to that. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I can see it. It's possible. Like we mentioned about a low drag setup and stuff. If Al, if Alwan gets a bit lucky with safety cars, like uh, like Aston Martin seems to do quite a bit, you know, that you could run the tires long, do a, do a stop less. It could be a two stop race for most. Could be a one stopper for him. You never know. So yeah, it's possible. I'd like to see it absolutely, uh, especially after obviously going through appendicitis and everything and being on um, being ox- oxygen or something like that. Obviously, he's in a bad way with it. So you know, it's um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be good to see him get a recovery with that. Absolutely, because just yeah, Singapore and Japan were too awful races to go back into after being away for a little bit and having an operation and everything that's not that's that's diving in beyond the deep end at that point that doesn't get much worse than a, a wet singapore and a pouring wet suzuka uh for a challenge anyway um but yeah so i'm gonna give you guys a chance to plug your outlets as well phil i've mentioned that you're part of the grip strip podcast uh, what is that and where can people find that yeah, the Gripster podcast is basically wherever you can find podcasts. You, you can find the GSP. We're also on YouTube at Gripster Podcast. Um, we cover all things motorsports, both in America and ab- abroad. Uh, we will cover uh, the U.S. Grand Prix this week on episode 139. We'll also be going over all the NASCAR news um big news with a big retirement um we also have moto gp nhra world rally championship and world super bikes we also talk football nfl might even get a some reference in a premier league there and a couple other things uh the yankees are about to get eliminated so i may not talk about that but that's beside the point um i'm at philip g matthew on twitter my co-host joshua finds jp huffine on twitter uh we're at Gripster Pod on Twitter. Um, George has been on the show. Tom and I, uh, and also Carl, did uh, the uncensored, unfiltered episodes in between the breaks. So that was pretty fun. Um, that was the least I've ever spoken on my podcast. So credit to those two guys, mainly Carl. Um, and I think it's part of why uh, Tom has why Tom has that balance there for him on the monkey seat, but. Um, thanks to you, George, and thanks everybody here on the um, Grid Talk side. Love being on, and Tom, and we we always have a good time and always have a little bit of fun, and even with some of the stuff that's going on in today's Formula One, uh, we kind of make it a little more positive, even if there are some veiled um, jabs here and there. But um, thanks to you, George, for hosting, and Tom, and everybody. I always love being on a, a part of the the grid talk deal yeah and we love having you on the show as well phil i mean i'm so, i'm so i've not even listened to you. i've not listened to many podcasts recently unfortunately i've not been in the gym much but i will give that one a listen where uh obviously um tom and, and carl are, are on your show as well i mean three of probably the three biggest cult heroes on the grid talk podcast on a collision course that is if that if that doesn't do well in the downloads i don't know what will because i really want to check that out um, but yeah, thanks for coming on as always. Um, Tom, I've mentioned that you're a co-host on the Good Talk podcast. Is there anything else you want to plug while we're at it? Yeah, so I do um, I do bits with Everything F1 as well. Uh, you can find them on on all the socials, you can you know, at join the F1. Um, and yeah, and also, obviously, you know, my, uh, I'm you know, a co-host this along, alongside yourself and well, about half a dozen, about half a dozen others now. Um, yeah, so you know, uh, you've already done the the, uh, the the plug for F1 Chronicle, so I'll uh, I'll shut up now. <laughs> so very eloquently put, as always, Tom. 
<laughs> uh yeah so yeah i will do the plug for the for from the uh, f1 chronicle as well i mean i'm wearing, I'm wearing the merch so it makes sense, of course. Uh, make sure to like us on Facebook. Or you can find us at F1 Chronicle. Same on Twitter as well, at F1 Chronicle. If you want to catch a show live as it goes out, I mentioned that we live stream these on YouTube. Head over to YouTube as well. Search, search for Grid Talk Podcast on there and you'll find us. I think we've gone over 700 subscribers now, which is absolutely madness. Thank you so much for all your support on there. It's always greatly appreciated. And uh, be sure to head over, over to our shop as well. Where you can check out our merchandise uh, f1chronicle.com forward slash store uh for the people on tiktok as well if you want to check out some 60 second rants from people like me and, and ruby you can go over there and we do one every week i'm sure we'll have something to react to uh for next week as well I'm not sure what it'll be yet but we'll figure out something um and we're also available on spotify apple music uh, amazon music verbal omni studio pocket cast and the f1 chronicle website itself uh, and yes, uh, I want to thank our panelists again for joining us. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to be back on Saturday. It'll be a late one for us in the UK, obviously, because we're going out about an hour after qualifying has concluded. And we'll be going out about an hour after the race has concluded as well this weekend. But we're there on Saturday to analyze qualifying for the USGP. Thank you very much for listening and watching. And goodbye.